Hello. I'm going to read today from the Office Tower Tales, which is my riff on the Canterbury Tales. Um, and the story I'm going to read is called The Office Romeo's Tale. Most of the stories in this volume don't follow uh, Chaucer's originals too closely, but this one has some echoes of the nun's priest's tale, which, if you remember, is the one where the, um, the proud cock uh, Chanticleer nearly gets himself in trouble with his vanity. Um, and it's kind of crossed in my version with um, an, a Mexican legend of the, the witch woman, uh, Ishtabe, who is rather dangerous to drunken young men. So here goes. The Office Romeo's Tale. The office Romeo sidles through the crowd, drinks held aloft like a flamenco dancer heisting castanets, ice cubes clicking. Up front, the microphone is fuzzy with the corporate officer's annual address, fourth quarter profits, and official Christmas oratory. Those in line with the speaker's eye clutch their highballs and nod as if they're grateful. But at the room's perimeter, no one's paying much attention. The office Romeo homes in on the wedge of secretaries by the entry. They all wear pretty dresses for this festivity, shoulder and cleavage displayed all day at desks, even if the air outside is arctic. He proffers a glass to the new girl from Lands and Properties. So, welcome to the company. His smile comes on. Oh, the girl from lands and properties is something else. A samba about to start. A tiny, perfect body, hair of fall, of glossy water, a white dress printed with green leaves. Across her shoulder, down her curved back, a large leaf curling to cup her hip. The office Romeo glows like a cartoon light bulb turned on. His pink shirt shines. His wide tie with the porky pig design loosens and falls. He smooths his forelock boyishly aside. He's the bright young man of accounts payable. His office has real walls. He keeps a calculator on his desk and dabs its keys with the end of his pen like a chicken pecking corn. The girls are laughing. There he goes again, they tell each other. Remember when Anita found the sock below his desk the morning after last year's Christmas party? Oh, he's hopeless, Christina mutters sourly. Two years ago, her earring made the morning after news found on the tightly woven carpet. She can still feel the rough scrub of rug burn his shoulders. But the girl from lands and properties is gazing at him, dark eyes receptive as film in a camera just waiting for light. He finds out she's from Mexico. Wow, he breathes, I just love Mexico. Go there every year, Cancun's the greatest. Do you come from there? The girl from Lands and Properties replies, she's from Yucatan, but not Cancun. Her home is further inland. Has he heard of Chichen Itza? He shakes his head. That's not a beach, is it? Those beaches at Cancun are awesome, and the babes? He's lost in reminiscence. The candy towers along Kukulkan Avenue, the beachside bars and pools, the hotels with marble caverns for foyers, the packages with everything included. He's lyric on the night at Senor Frogs, how drunk he got on tequila, nearly croaked, ate the worm at the bottom of the bottle on a bed, threw up in a bed of flowers. Oh man, it was terrific. So now I call you Senor Frog, she says, and for a blinking moment he thinks she might be making fun of him. But 
Her eyes are connecting with his like a laser beam with a compact disc, and he knows he'll like the music. The official hospitality winds down. Most of the older guys head home, but the young and party-hearty ones form wavering parades to the pub nearby, prop themselves at breast-high tables around the dance floor. Waitresses squeeze by with boxes of complimentary popcorn. Trays of drinks sway overhead like palm trees in a breeze. The office Romeo is on the floor already, strutting his shiny boots, shaking his shoulders, throwing back his head so his red hair sprays up. Look at him. The girls perched high on bar stools giggle. He looks like a rooster revving up. The girl from lands and properties dances the same sway rhythm to every song. Neat swing of hips that somehow always keeps the beat. Arms held close to breasts, she looks cool in spite of heat steaming from the office Romeo. Let me get you a drink, he gasps as the last chords fade. So, what's your name again? She sits her daiquiri, leaves no lipstick stain on the sugary rim. I'm called Ishtabe. Ishtabe. He leans earnestly against the bar to show that he's intense and sensitive as well. That's different. Is that like the name of some beach? She smiles, says it's a Mayan name from long ago. Oh, Mayan, he says vaguely. Cool, so have you got a boyfriend? Her face looks sad. No, the one I had got sick. Further down the bar, the other girls are a flowery spectrum of observers. Shouldn't someone warn her? Jasmine asks. He's just looking to get laid, says Rosa, philosophically. You know a cock is going to crow when the sun comes up. You know Ricky there will try and score at the Christmas party. He isn't complicated. She's got him figured out. Christina's fist closes on her glass. Someday, someone's going to give him AIDS, she hisses, viciously optimistic. Oh, come on, says Rosa. He's harmless. He'll grow up eventually. Some don't. Eleanor's the older one, the payroll supervisor. She lost a lot of weight after the divorce. Some just never learn unless they're forced to. Meanwhile, the office Romeo is feeling fuzzier all the time, tequila sunrise sliding down as though it's sunset on Montego Bay, but they must be having a great conversation. The way she leans toward him, he seems to hear, I like your voice, bet you can sing, oh, the way your hips move. Though really, just, she's just gazing with those amazing eyes, intent. He hazily congratulates himself. You don't just get lucky. It's good management. So it's hardly any time until the DJ spins his last disc and they're slipping back across the street. He's going to show her his calculator or something. He's forgotten who suggested what. She's stepping through snowflakes in her sandals. Never a shiver, as if it's a drift of sparkling petals for her painted toes. The elevator sags to a stop. The office Romeo steps out. Welcome to Bean Counter Central, he intones, with a miscalculated flourish that barks his knuckles on the wall. Bean. She looks puzzled and then gleams, a smile for something funny he can't see. 
He pats the secret code on plastic buttons beside the doorknob and bows her in. The cubicles and desks are dimly lit by red exit lights and street lamp glow beyond the windows. The shadows suddenly look lively as Ishta Bay sways past them to the door with Ricky's name tacked up on a plastic plaque. She slides her coat off awkwardly like something foreign she's not used to, looks around the room for somewhere to put it. Her skin, so golden in the bar, now shines white and phosphorescent in the snow-light shimmer. The office Romeo feels suddenly like he's not quite so sure where to put himself. I gotta take a leak, he mumbles. Be right back. By the urinal, he shakes drops from his wilted wonder and wonders if he hasn't had a drop or two too much. Coming back along the corridor, he hears the girl from Lands and Properties. She's singing something soft, exotic, and she's moving round his office, touching walls, caressing corners. He shuts the door, pulls off his tie. Here! Let me show you. But it's her who's showing him leaf-printed dress slipping from one shoulder, hair straying in a dark web across a breast so awfully white. The office Romeo feels very short of breath. His pants have dropped around his knees. How did his belt come unbuckled? His shirt is flapping at his backside, his backside is flapping at the window, and he's backing up, not sure why, except he's feeling clammy, and her breath is suddenly sour as a hangover. She touches his chest with a forefinger that now seems all nail. Sharp pain rips around his heart, and something's going swimmy with his eyes beyond her shoulder vines are sprouting up the wall. His desk has turned into the surface of a pond and frogs are popping off and on the lily pad like a squad of croaking cheerleaders. I d d d d don't think I, I want to, he stutters like a calculator with a stuck key. The room erupts. It's full of branches. Startled eyes stare out at him, stare at his shorts embroidered with the Playboy bunny, stare at his pallid legs poking from brown socks, his palpitating chest. He's netted round with leaves. His groin feels like bark is growing over it. Beans, he thinks she's saying. No, no, he whimpers, hopping sideways, hobbled by his trousers towards his desk. The leaping frogs are still there, but so's his calculator. He grabs it as he falls and holds it up as though the talismanic cross of numbers on its plastic face might have some feeble power. But he only seems to hear a scornful comment. Good management. No, look, I'm sorry. He's trying to pull his pants up, but they're dissolving into leaves and his shirt's becoming straw. I'll never do it again. One extra large frog bops up from the pond desk, splats against his chest, knocks him on his back. She's looming over him, breath like rotting sewage, and he's paddling backwards frantically, pushing his feet against the carpet, feeling his shoulders burn. Oh, let me go, he whimpers. You're gorgeous, but I, I must have left the wrong impression. I have this girlfriend. Her name's Christina. There's a pause, as though the frogs have stopped mid-jump, and for a moment the room turns ordinary again. Just one small woman in a white dress, staring down at him, surprised. Just a flash. But time enough for Ricky to reach his feet and wrench the door open before the frog cacophony starts up again. He flees the hallway. No time to wait for elevators, and anyway, vines are 
bursting from the bulging shaft and walls are quaking with demonic laughter. He gallops to the stairwell, down ten dizzy floors. He gallops through the whirl of revolving doors into the street in his shorts, without his shoes or wallet, no castanet of keys to car or condo, and it's cold, cold December. Ricky's teeth ache. His love life passes before his eyes. He starts to wonder humbly if he can remember Christina's number. Thank you. One, Hugh can take it. You can bear pain, Hugh can. But you can't stand to see it in others. It makes your hands and feet hurt. The gray room is full of gray people in various stages of pain. A little party grouped by the window, sitting on the bed, 10 or 12 of them, 